Mark Forsyth from the BC Historical Federation, and I am so pleased to be with Jackie Pierce, who is the author of this uh, cover article in our British Columbia History magazine from the spring, all about haiku in Tashmi. And uh, we're, we're going to take you inside this cover in, in just a moment and, and tell you about the people and the place where, where haiku was created during the, the Second World War here in British Columbia. But Jackie, uh, welcome. It's great to have you here to talk Hi. about your project and the work that you have done uh, with a colleague, Jean-Pierre Antonio, through a, a Centennial Legacy Fund grant in part from the uh, BC Historical Federation. Well, this is the Tashmi Haiku Club that uh, was a gathering in Tashmi internment camp, which was located in the BC interior just east of Hope. And this was the largest camp during the internment years during the Second World War, and also the last one that was created. And I should mention that um, my project I've been working on with uh, Jean-Pierre Antonio and also Michiko Kihara, who is, uh, they are both actually residing in Japan right now. And uh, they are the key translators of, of the haiku. Jackie, let's go inside this photograph that people can see of uh, a gathering of people. Who are they and where are they? All right, Mark, this is uh, one of uh, the, I think, three photos we have of the Haiku Club in Tashmi internment camp. And it does look um, a little bit formal, so they may have been taking this photo for a special occasion, maybe a special visitor uh, or something like that. But unfortunately, we don't have the that background information. I know who three people are in this photo. On the top right is Sukio Samashima or Sam Samashima. And he is a key person in why we even have the haiku that, we, that we're translating. And then to his left uh, by two people. Uh, so yes, that's right. That's uh, Toreo Takada who is the teacher of the club or the sensei of the club. And we didn't actually know anything about him until more recently as our puzzle pieces began to fit together. And then also there's a woman, I think it's the woman um, directly below him who is Mrs. Nakamoto. And we don't have any information about her. So, and I don't know who the other people are. So members, this is, and, a, and this is what you're learning as you continue to research, isn't it? And, yeah. And, and I think many people watching perhaps have heard of, of Tashmi, but maybe they haven't. And, and I know that thousands of people drive by on number three, uh, just beyond the Hope Slide into this beautiful Sunshine Valley, but don't realize this internment camp was there. Maybe before we talk about the haiku project itself, could you take us to the camp um, and, and what conditions were like there? What, what right. are we looking at now? Well, uh, originally this site was a working farm and then during the Second World War when the government was putting together the internment camps, I think they rented the farm for the camp and they constructed, and I believe even the internees themselves had to work on the construction of these little shacks and they're very minimal, small tar paper, no insulation. And I believe they even started with tents. And this is the uh, interior of BC where we have really harsh winters. Those and, outflow and, winds tearing through there in the yeah, winter would be something. Yeah. I, I can't imagine being in those in through through the winter months. And this camp, it, it was huge, wasn't it, in yes, terms this, of the other camps? This was the largest internment camp in BC, so about 26. 600 people, I think, at its height. There were several other smaller camps in BC. And uh, for example, the New Denver site, there is a museum there where you can see some actual cabins that are still standing. Yes, they've done a remarkable job re restoring those and telling the story of what daily life was like. And here we go next inside a barn and it's still standing, but who, who yeah. would have stayed in the barns? Well, this is an actual barn that was there before the internment camp. And during the camp years, this is where the single men were housed. And you can see this huge open space with, again, no insulation. And they would have had um, maybe blankets dividing the beds, so no, no room division. And then at one end, there would have been a stove to heat the whole place. 
you've stood in there. What did it feel like to, oh. to realize that? Well, we were visiting, Jean Pierre and I visited uh, during February 2019. And there was about two to three feet of snow on the ground. It was really cold. And apparently it was a warm year. So <laughs> there weren't, there wasn't as much snow as during some of these years that people were here. And it was very cold in there. We had our coats on and everything. So it's, I, it's hard to imagine what people experienced, especially because they were coming from their homes in Vancouver and in, and in towns along the West Coast where they were used to modern conveniences. They were, kids were used to going to schools and um, people were driving cars and had radios and going out to movies and everything else that everyone else was doing in cities and towns and, and BC at the time. So and then they're flunked down here in, exactly. in the most spare of, of conditions. And then yeah. the next the next image, this is part of the Tashmi Museum that you can experience if, if you stop uh, and visit. Uh, tell us about, about this particular, uh, I guess it's one of the huts. Yeah, so uh, what the museum is, it was created by uh, Ryan Ellen, who, who lives and owns some of the property there. And he created this reconstructed camp uh, partly because he would have, over the years, people who's, who had been in the internment camp or whose family members had been in, they would stop by and be looking for something. And so he created the museum to house the artifacts that he had come across, say, in the walls of some of the farm buildings. He had found artifacts from internment. And this is what one of the shacks would have looked like. So this is the main space with two small bedrooms off on one side and either say a family of maybe five or so or two small families would have lived in these buildings and there are no doors on the bedrooms. So very little privacy and the door on the house didn't lock either. Puts me in mind of the huts at uh, New Denver where the arrangement was, I think the, the kitchen was in the middle and then they had a bedroom at either end right. of, of the hut as well. But yes, yeah. families of five, 10 people in there, it's, it's yeah. hard to imagine. Yeah. But what's also remarkable is uh, they were in internment, they were, they were imprisoned, but they did reorganize their lives there to a great extent, didn't they? They had, they had yeah. uh, schooling, hospitals and even uh pastimes like baseball yes let's, especially let's, let's talk about this particular image of the Hayab hayabasha team right so this is a men's baseball team and and uh, i imagine they were i don't know a lot about the baseball in camps but they would have been playing teams from other camps so they would have had permission to travel to play and uh tashmi because it had so many people it was Actually, some of the kids, people who were children during the camp years, remember it fondly because there were so many people and so many activities and clubs and there was um, kendo and um, dance clubs and sports clubs and, and of course there was the haiku club. Yes, and the man that uh, you thank to this day is, is Sam or Tsukiyo. Tsukiyo. Tsukiyo Samashima and... Yes. Uh, He's important to your research and you'll have to tell us why. Yeah, so Sam is actually, he was born in New Westminster in 1915, I think. And his uh, parents came from Japan and his family actually took him and his siblings back to Japan for five to 10 years, I think, so that they could have Japanese education. And then he returned at about age 16 and his dad was uh, running a shoe repair business in Nanaimo at the time, I believe. And Sam apprenticed there for a while. And then he moved out on, to his, on his own to Port Alberni on Vancouver Island and started his own shoe repair business. And that's actually where he was first introduced to haiku. He joined a haiku club in Port Alberni. And, um, and then was soon after that was in turn, first moved to Hastings Park, at the site of what's now the PE, and he was actually doing a shoe repair there for a while until he was eventually interned at Tashmi. And he was involved uh, with the Tashmi Haiku Club and with collecting together these, um, these anthologies, two main anthologies that we have, and he saved those through all his time after the internment years. And then he donated his uh, haiku collections and his 
haiku books, uh, all to the Nikkei Museum, the National um, Japanese National Museum and Archives. And this is where we kind of intersected at that point. Um, and so um, this is he, one of he, the- He lectures. lived to be what, 102 almost? Yes, uh, he died in fall 2017, just shy of his two, his 102nd birthday. And we were actually able to interview him through the mail with help from his wife, Kay, and who we actually, I believe, met and married in Tashmi camp. They were one of the first couples to marry in camp. So what was motivating you and, and uh, Jean-Pierre and, and your collaborators to take the Japanese haiku and present it in English? A few different motivations. Uh, I have a background. Uh, I write children's books and I'm interested in local history. So some of my books talk about uh, BC history and uh, internment history is actually part of the first book for kids that I wrote. And then I'm also a haiku poet interested in haiku a poetry in general. And I just began sort of collecting together whenever I came across in an anthology of um, maybe Canadian literature in general, especially or literature written by people during the uh, Second World War and internment years, there might be a few haiku included. So I make a note of that. And I, I was just wondering what else was out there and whether it was still, we could still find it and put it, bring it all together. Thanks to Sam, you had a bonanza, didn't you, of uh, yes. haiku. How, yes, how many between the two collections? I think there are 600 haiku. <laughs> wow. So and, we've, I think we've translated uh, between 200 and 300. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the cover that we're looking at now of one of these collections? Yes. And this what, one what can you tell us about the cover? What's it depicting, do you think? Well, it appears to be the camp, you know, the farm there with the, the barn and the silos and then the mountains that surrounded the camp. This collection is called Yamabiko, which is Mountain Echo. So very much um, inspired by the surroundings, the natural surroundings. What are the challenges before, before we look at some examples of haiku? Of, of taking it from the original Japanese and translating it and translating the meaning and the emotion that goes with that. Right. It's, it's, um, it's actually quite challenging, um, partly because uh, we don't have a sample here, but um, the haiku themselves are handwritten and then mimeographed. So we're looking at very dense pages of kanji, Japanese kanji written vertically down the page. So lines and lines of these. And then with at the bottom, the kanji representing the pen name of the poet. So at first we didn't even know the names of the poets. We had these pen names. And so it was one of the mysteries is to try and, and put some of them together. And actually the first one we were able to put together was Sam's, Samashima's pen name. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't think to ask that in the interview because we didn't know about this yet. And then uh, he was published in um, uh, the, Fro it's called Frog Pond, which is the journal of the Haiku Society of America. And this was actually in um, 2002. Some of his poems were published in, and an interview with him is published there. And they listed him, it was either there or actually another, <laughs> another place where a couple of his poems were listed as um, Sam Mokuchin, um, I think that's, that's right, I'm getting- Sam Mokuchin, we, we have yes. Yes. that example <laughs> on the screen for people to see now, yes. Yes, thank you, I needed that. Um, so his, his name, his pen name was actually listed as a middle name and we realized that it's not common for Japanese people to have middle names. And this was a clue that this was his pen name. So we were able to put that together and realize that there were several haiku in the collections written by Mokuchi. So that's and, where we started with that. And let's, let's go through a few examples here of, of the haiku. And, and this emerges from Tashmi itself, does it? Yes. So the, most of the poems seem to be in direct response to daily life in Tashmi. So this one, we have the kanji at first, which originally would have been written vertically rather vertically. than horizontally. 
and it was just written all in one line, whereas we've separated it a little bit so you can see that it's divided into three parts. And in Japanese, they would have been thinking of sounds. So you may know, uh, most of us are taught in elementary school that haiku is 17 syllables. Well, in, actually in Japanese, they were not, not syllables, but a unit of sound which is called on. And it's actually a much shorter unit of sound than a syllable. So when we're translating it into English, we don't translate it into 17 English syllables. It becomes too wordy and encumbered that way. So trying to just stick with um, the, the, the wording, the main concepts, that the poet has has in the original and so the second part is the direct translation which would be plow horse return setting sun embraced tree line um, road and it's a it takes a bit that seems very simple but it takes a bit of um discussion and working out how to translate that because the japanese is a bit ambiguous it doesn't usually have a pronoun, so you don't know who is acting in the haiku. And it doesn't necessarily say where it's, whether it's plural or singular, so you have to guess that by the context. And then with this one, at first we weren't sure whether the sun was embracing the road or the road was embracing the sun, or, you know, or is that just a metaphor? Is that what it appeared to look like? So there's those kind of questions. And then sometimes the kanji are actually not in use anymore. Uh, they were discontinued. Just to add a whole new layer of complexity <laughs> yeah. to your translation. Yeah, but, so. but the result, your English IQ is beautiful. Uh, maybe so, you could read that for us yes. because it, it's so visual. You can see this. So, and it's really not that much different from the direct translation, but just puts it in, in a little bit more of the structure. Returning plow horse. The tree-lined road embraces the setting sun. So Sam could have been out there working in the fields because they would have grown much of their own food too, I yes. suppose. Yes, yes. And they were also working to pay for their internment, mm. from what I understand. I don't know all the details. Um, it's more research I have to do. <laughs> yeah. Jackie, our next haiku uh, is all about chrysanthemums, or in part, because these haiku contain different to emotions and different images, I know, but uh, take us through this one. Well, this is by Roy Sumi, who is someone who we discovered more recently through uh, some of these puzzle pieces serendipitously coming together as we talk to more people or also the, the archivists at, at the Nikkei archives uh, spoke to someone who was actually doing a, a video about, a documentary about Roy Sumi. And he, he was actually, after the internment years, he went on to design uh, the Nitobe Gardens, Japanese garden at UBC, oh. and also the garden surrounding New Denver, the New Denver Museum. So They're he became well known as a garden architect and, and uh, I believe a, um, a bonsai artist. And it just so happened that that his family was able to now identify his his image in the Haiku Club photos. He wasn't in that one we showed earlier, but he's in a couple of the other ones. And this um, and and also we're able to give us his pen name Jochiku, which means like bamboo. Uh, in, in in Japan in Japanese, the uh, bamboo is is recognized as resilient. It bends in the wind but doesn't break. So we were able to find the haiku written by Jachiku and to translate those. So, so you, this, you, you have the, the original Japanese script and then uh, the sort of the essence of, of yeah, what Yeah, the direct it's translation. Mm -hmm. And so the direct translation is basically just telling us what those words mean, their surface meaning. But we were, with the help of uh, our translator Michiko, and also um, a woman who's part of the Vancouver Haiku Club, Rachel Enemoto, she is Japanese and lives here in Canada, and she's more familiar with the whole background of haiku, and uh, also of uh, tanka or waka, which is er an earlier form of Japanese poetry that haiku emerged from. And she suggested that in Tanka in particular, there's a lot of symbolism 
And so this poem might on the surface be just a description of the scenery of the chrysanthemums growing in the Tajmi site, but it could also be symbolizing in the dew, it could be tears, sadness, Chrysanthemums could actually symbolize the Japanese royal family or Japan itself. So the poet could be thinking about Japan and I hear no sound could also relate to a question being asked and receiving no answer, which is a tradition in that earlier poetry. So here the poet could be perhaps talking about or thinking about Japan and not hearing any news, wondering what's happening and feeling sad for the circumstances in Japan. We don't know that for sure because he's not around to ask, but that's a possibility. So, um, That's a fascinating part of your project, yes. isn't it? Trying to interpret or... Yes, and it also is an example of how these very tiny little poems can contain quite a lot of meaning or allude to meaning which um, the reader might be able to add to the story as well. We have one more example of haiku to conclude with and this is this is a very sad poem. Um, yes. And what do you think the story is behind this one? This poem is written by someone by the pen name Lonesome Village and I believe this is one of the female poets but we don't have her name we haven't connected the two yet and I should mention, by the way, that if anyone is, is uh, viewing this and they have relatives who were in Tajmi or any of the other camps, and they have any information about um, people who are writing haiku, pen names, any haiku or documents that still exist, we are looking for all of those. And they can be donated or copies can be given to the Nikkei archives. Uh, so they can be, they can be part of the, the entire history of, of this. So uh, what this poet is addressing is during the camp, years at camp, there, there was a, a stream that flowed nearby. And in one year, two young children drowned in the stream in different incidences. Mm -hmm. And I think here this poet is grappling with this tragedy. And she actually wrote several poems about this one incident. And so this is an example of how the poetry could be a way of dealing with these deeper emotions in a sort of a comfortable, maybe comfortable is not the right word, but in a, a socially acceptable way uh, uh, within the camps. And so the, 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 the poets were writing often about their physical details of daily life, um, and noticing the beauty of nature around them, which often gave them some strength during these circumstances. And in this case, this is an example of, of a specific incident that was very hard to deal with. So the poem is very simple and it doesn't specifically talk about the drowning, but once you know what's happened, it takes on that extra very poignant meaning and shall I, shall I read it? Please do. A life taken into the summer sky, the sound of water. And there's a bit of ambiguity because when we're translating it, is it the life going into the sky? Is it the water, the sound of the water going into the sky? And we've left it ambiguous because I think the poet perhaps intended that ambigu ambiguity. It could be read either way which is poetry yes. <laughs> in itself, in its essence, isn't it? Yes, um, and I think there are, and also I've got the word heaven in with a question mark with the direct translation. And sometimes there's a particular kanji that could be translated as sky or it could perhaps be translated as heaven. It's kind of debatable and perhaps both meanings are contained in, in this. Well, Jackie, uh, Congratulations on what you have achieved here so far, almost halfway through this collection of, of 600 and, and adding more to it. And uh, I guess I'd like to ask you on behalf of the uh, Historical Federation, how important the Centennial Legacy Fund grant was for you in, in getting you this far. Right, well, it was, ex very, it was very exciting and gratifying for us because here we were, we've been working on this project 
as volunteers, uh, as we're working on many other things at the same time. So sort of on the corner of our desks over a few years, and then we received the grant. So it was like a validation of our work that this is significant. And, and we think that this is actually significant as part of Canadian literature in general. And we want to see as many of these haiku saved as possible. So uh, we really felt that the, the, the grant helped us to, um, to motivate us and, and, and to feel um, that our work is worthwhile. Oh, we're really pleased that uh, you also presented it for our readers in British Columbia History Magazine in the spring and, and we'll send people there if they would like to read more examples of the haiku and about Tashmi itself and uh, your collaboration as well. Jackie, thank you so much for your time now. Best of thank luck in, in stage two or three or four of the yes. project. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's going to be an ongoing project and hope to eventually do a book. Thanks so much. Thank you.